Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for our workers, your own workers, your servants, soul winners. We're asking, Lord, tonight that you speak to every heart clearly in Jesus' name. And your word will benefit everyone. Energize your people. We're studying about Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas are no more here. We are the people here. I pray, Lord, your power will saturate every life. And our ministry will bear fruit in Jesus' name. Bless your people. Make them channels of blessing. And as they go out tomorrow and every time, I pray that signs and wonders, salvation and seekers will follow after them in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And somebody shout. God bless you. Tonight we're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. I'm sure you know the background to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. In chapter 15, the church had met together. And as the church met together, they decided that the Gentiles will not be circumcised. Once they are saved, their salvation depends on Christ. And Christ and Christ alone will be their savior without keeping the law of Moses. And so they sent Judas and Silas together with Paul and Barnabas to go to the various churches and deliver to them the decision that they are taking at the headquarters church. And so they went and they delivered to them that decree. And there was great joy in the church. And now Paul the apostle at the end of chapter 15 said to Barnabas, let us go and see all the converts and all the places they have been to in preaching the word. Well, Barnabas decided, you know the story, that John Mark had to go with them. And there was a disagreement. Eventually, the church recommended Silas, that Silas would go with Paul the apostle. And he came to all those churches and delivered the decree for them to keep. And as they went on preaching, they came to Philippi. And in Philippi, there was this damsel that had the spirit of divination. And then proclaimed, these are the men, servants of God, that proclaim unto us, declare unto us the word of salvation. And Paul the apostle, being grieved in his spirit, commanded that evil spirit to come out. And the evil spirit came out immediately. The leaders and the parents of the damsel, they were angry. And because of that, they brought Paul and Silas under persecution. They were beaten mercilessly. And then he threw them into the prison. And this is where we we'll meet them now in the prison. That's why they went to the prison because they were preaching the word. And now it says in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. They could have been mourning, complaining. They could have been asking the question why, but they did not. No complaint, but prayer. And there was no murmuring but prayer. They felt the pain, but they were not panicking. They could have been panicking and they could have said, This is a strange land, Philippi. We've never been here before. What next will happen? But instead of complaining and instead of murmuring, what they did was to pray. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And eventually, you know, the story, a miracle happened. A miracle will happen through you. The, the prison uh, foundations were shaking. And all the prisoners lost uh, their bands. The, 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 uh, the, the bands were loosed. And eventually, the Philippian jailer came out and said, 
men, brethren, what will I do to be saved? And he told him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thine house. And then he took them to the house, they spoke the word of God to the house, and the people believed they were baptized in water. And then he took them, and he gave them food, and he washed all their wounds. That's the story we're looking at. The topic tonight is the gracious wonder of salvation for all. The gracious wonder of salvation for all. there are three things we're looking at number one we have the wonder of the supernatural through praises when you praise the lord you're praying and you're praising the lord you're worshiping you're honoring the lord you're not complaining you're not frowning you're not bitter you're not asking the question why has this happened but in all situations at all times you're praying and you're praising the lord well the praise Places, there will be the wonder of supernatural manifestation point number two the word of salvation from the preachers from Paul and Silas when that man asked the question what shall we do to be saved he didn't say we don't have an outline we are not ready for that the preachers should be ready every time that the word of salvation is coming from you in whatever situation you find yourself the word of salvation from the preachers number three is the work of the Savior in the penitent as uh, people repent and they turn away from their sins then we have uh, the work of the savior in the penitent let's come to number one now in number one we have the wonder of the supernatural through praises we're coming to acts chapter 16 verses 25 and 26 open your bible in acts 16 verse 25 and at midnight paul and silas prayed and sang praises unto god sang praises unto god and the prisoners had them verse 26 it tells us and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaking and immediately all the doors were opened all the doors were opened it will happen to you it will happen through you that all the doors that bound the people and all the doors that kept the people in in slavery in the prison as prisoners all their doors were now open and everyone's bands were loosed there are three things we're looking at here number one the apostles watchfulness and prayer during trials the apostles watchfulness and prayer during trials number two they are sending worship of praises in tribulation they are sending worship of praises in tribulation number three they are astonishing wonders and power for triumph the astonishing wonders that he does on our behalf that he does on behalf of the people we're reaching out to and the power for triumph let's look at number one the apostles watchfulness and prayer during trials now it may surprise you that as we're talking about paul and silas we're talking about them as apostles because if we look at Silas, look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. So chapter 15, we're reading from verse 22. Acts chapter 15, verse 22. And you'll see Silas there. It says, Then pleased each the apostles and the elders and the whole church, and to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely, Judas saw named Basabas and Silas chief men among the brethren. At this time as we were meeting Silas, he was one of the chief men among the brethren. Look at verse 32 there, chapter 15, verse 32. It tells us there in verse 32, it says, verse 32, as you look at that verse 32, it tells us about Judas and about Silas and he called them prophets. He referred to them 
as prophets. The point here is, as you have the situation in which you are, and as you are maybe just a soul winner, maybe just a district pastor, maybe just a group pastor, and then you are yielded and you are surrendered and you are sent out, you then go from where you are to where you ought to be. But if you just stay where you are, I am such and such, and this is all I do, and no more, there will be no progress, there will be no promotion. But if you look at chapter 15, verse 32, it says Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves. Prophets themselves exalted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. He was just, not Silas now, was just a prophet. And as you, as you know, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the definer of the body of Christ. But now we're referring to him as an apostle. We're coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 1. And Paul and Silvanus, that's uh, the same silence, and Timothy unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It mentions Paul there, mentions Silas there. Come to chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. He's talking about himself, Paul, and talking about Silas and Timothy. He says, you know, our entrance unto you. When we came to you to declare the word of God, look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, but even after that, we are had suffered before it's referring to their persecution it's referring to what they went through in philippi we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated as she know at philippi that's paul and silas where we suffered we were shamefully entreated at philippi as she know we were bold in our god to speak unto you the gospel of god with much contention now look at verse 6 in verse 6 it says nor of men sought we glory it's talking about paul and silas we neither of you nor yet of others when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. That's why we refer now to both of them, to both Paul and Silas as apostles. What first of all, he was one of the chief men, one of the notable men among the brethren that were read in Acts. But then he kept on developing himself, kept on growing, and became one of the prophets, preachers, proclaimers of the gospel in the Jerusalem church. And then as we're meeting them now, after going through that persecution and that suffering, and he said, Now we are a apostles of Christ. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 4 verse 2. What do we do as uh, chief men among uh, the brethren? What do we do as the proclaimers of the word of God? What do we do as the apostles, the saint one by the Lord? And we're going everywhere and we're preaching the word. It says we're continuing prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And that's what they were doing. If we're children of God and thank God we're children of God and we're servants of God, we continue in a prayer. Whatever is happening, you are misunderstood. Whatever is happening, you're persecuted. Whatever is happening, you are in trials. Whatever is happening, trouble comes upon you because you are declaring the word of God. You continue like Paul and Silas in prayer and we watch with thanksgiving. We watch with thanksgiving. That's why it says at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed unto God and they sang praises unto the Lord and the prisoners heard them. Let's come to number two here. Number two here, we're looking at ascending worship of praises in tribulation. 
ascending uh, worship or praises in tribulation. We're coming back to Acts chapter 16, verse 25. It says at midnight, think about that, no light at midnight, in the prison at midnight, when Paul could not have the convenience of having a good bed to sleep on at midnight, when they should have been sleeping and resting after working and laboring during the, during the day at midnight, when all the other prisoners were already asleep at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. Do you ever pray at night? Do you sometimes wake up, not because you cannot sleep, but because you deliberately deny yourself of sleeping? And you are praying unto God. And this is not a usual prayer. You see, there are people, they say they are praying, and they are reading from a particular prayer book. Now, it says, Ask, it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. Everyone that asketh receiveth. Which of you having children, if they will ask bread? Now, if they are going to ask bread, do they take a book? And then out of that book, they are reading reading to mommy or they're reading to daddy uh, mommy this morning at 7 30 just what they have written there i need bread i need breakfast we don't do that in prayer we don't do that the lord does not expect when we say we're praying we're copying from somebody we're parroting somebody we're mimicking somebody we're repeating what the other people what they're saying you go as a child of god you go as a minister of god you go as a servant of god and with your own voice and with your own understanding you know the promise of God and you know the uh, the commandments of God and you ask and you pray according to the word of God at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God please remember they didn't give them light to open a song book and begin to sing they just sang they sang, you know, Paul sang, apostle, and uh, Silas uh, sang, also an apostle, and they sang unto the Lord. They sang with understanding. They knew the words of what they were singing. And then Paul the apostle said, I will sing with understanding. I will sing with the spirit. Their heart was there. You know, there are people that sing, even when we're in church, they do not understand the words of the songs they are singing. I don't know whether it has happened to you. There were some songs we learned in the primary school. We just learned. We just sang. It is now as adults, after 30 years, after 40 years, those songs come back. It's now we are even understanding the meaning of the words of those songs. But you see, when a Christian is singing, you sing with understanding and you sing with the spirit. Your heart is into that singing. And the promises in the song and all the things you have in the song will get into your heart. That's the way they sang. And when you sing like that, they sang unto God. You see, when you're doing something unto God, you do it with your heart. You do it with your mind. You do it with everything you have so that it is part of your loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And they sang like that unto God. And the prisoners heard them ascending worship of praises in tribulation well paul was not surprised that you know we have this challenge we have this tribulation not the great tribulation but the persecution that a child of god will go through in john chapter 16 verse 33 john chapter 16 verse 33 these things have i spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace in the world ye shall have tribulation the lord has told us already in the world ye shall have trials ye shall have trouble ye shall have persecution ye shall have opposition ye shall have misunderstanding in the world ye shall have tribulation but be of good cheer when you are in that tribulation when you are in that trial when you are in that trouble be of good cheer don't be sour don't be moody and don't be crying and don't be fearful and don't panic 
and those think that the world is collapsing, there will be tribulation. But in the midst of that tribulation, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He overcame the world for you. I said he overcame the world for you. And because of that, whatever is happening, be of good cheer. That's exactly what happened to Paul and Silas. They were of good cheer and they sang praises unto God. Look at Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of god isn't it wonderful that paul the apostle didn't forget what he had preached to other people he said we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of god now the tribulation came and they were beating and he didn't say, what is all this? You must remember what you preach. When there is trial, when there is temptation, when there is tribulation, and what you told other people to do that same, you must do. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verses 3 and 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're reading from verses 3 and 4. It says in verse 3, we're bound to thank God. God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that our your faith grows exceedingly. Your faith grows exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounded. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it says, So that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure as you look at verses three and four together their faith was growing and yet there were persecutions and tribulations and their charity their love love for god and love for each other everything was growing and yet there were persecutions and tribulations they were following after what Jesus had said that in the world you will have trial, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Don't go in a corner and be saying, I don't know why this happened. What are we going to do now? They kept on increasing in their faith. They kept on increasing in their love and charity and they endured cheerfully. Look at uh, Second Corinthians chapter 12, uh, reading from verse 9. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, uh, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. He was uh, having all this buffeting of the devil and all the persecution and all the trials. That's Paul the Apostle. And then he went to God and he said, remove this from me. And the answer of the Lord is persecution will come, tribulation will come, trial will come. But my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, most cheerfully, therefore, most gladly, therefore, I'm even happy at this now because I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Look at verse 10. It says in verse 10, therefore, I take pleasure. I don't complain. Therefore, I take pleasure. I don't murmur. Therefore, I take pleasure. I take delight in infirmities and reproaches and necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, everybody say what follows. Then am I strong. The Lord keep you strong, whatever may be happening in your life in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three is the astonishing wonders and power for triumph. Astonishing wonders and power for triumph. It also seen in um, Acts chapter 16. Uh, let's look at verse 26. In verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake. Can you imagine that just Paul and Silas? praying to God, not complaining, not murmuring, 
not saying why they did something just praying to God and singing praises to God suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaking and immediately all the doors were open and every one's bands were loosed why did, they, did that happen? Look at Psalm 22, verse 3. Psalm 22, verse 3 tells us that, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. When you praise God, God shows up and he inhabits the praises of the children of God. And when he inhabits the praises of the children of God, I want you to understand, Paul and Paul, and Silas were in the prison. They were praising God, worshipping God in prisons. And then God came in there. And the prison was too small to contain God. Because he inhabits the prisons of Israel. And that thing burst. That's why the prison doors were opened. And the foundations were shaking. When you praise God like that, God will show up. And the power of God and the presence of God will burst all your prisons in Jesus' name. No bondage in your life again. It tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 21. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 21. He is thy praise. He is thy God. He that has done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. And if you want those great and wonderful things that happened before to Paul and Silas, to the children of Israel, and to the servants of God, in every age, in every generation, all you have to do is to make sure you are praising God, because when you are praising God, He will come in His mighty presence, in His great power, and Bust all the chains and, sh and shackles out of your life in Jesus' name. And hey, look at Joshua chapter 6, verse 20. You see, they were all uh, debarred to enter into the land of Canaan because of the Jericho walls. But you know what happened? Instead of carrying uh, spears and whatever, uh, bulldozers to bring down the walls, all they did was to just praise the Lord. The walls were still there, and the walls were still high and thick and still stood between them and the promised land. But in the praises of God, all your Jericho walls will fall down. It tells us in Joshua chapter 6, verse 20, So the people shouted when the priests blew up the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the walls fell down flat. Your walls will fall down. And then it says, so that the people went up into the city, every man stretched before him, and he took the city. Look at Second Chronicles chapter 20, reading from verse 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. Jehoshaphat had said, All these great, mighty warriors are against us in a great confederacy, and we know not what to do. When problems come in your life and you do not know what to do, just start praising God, praising God, and praising God, and all those problems will dissolve in Jesus' name. In Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20, and they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God. God, believe in the Lord your God. If you believe in the Lord your God, you'll not panic, you'll not be fearful, you'll not be timid, you'll not run back in the day of battle, you'll not let down and let go, you will not surrender to the enemy. If you believe in the Lord your God, believe in the Lord your God, and so shall ye be established. The Lord will establish you. Every promise he had given you, every promise he had pronounced in your life will be established as you believe in your God in Jesus' name. 
believe these prophets. Why? Because the prophets were and still are the representatives of God. You have not seen God at any time, but he sent his prophets with his word to reveal his might unto you. And you believe those prophets who are representing God. It says, believe his prophets and so shall ye prosper. Somebody there will prosper. In verse 21, in verse 21, it tells us, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that that should praise the beauty of holiness. Praise the beauty of holiness. Praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Then in verse 22, it tells us in verse 22, and when they began to sing and to praise, when they began to sing and to praise, I need to remind you once again, because you see, there's so many Christians. There's so many soul winners there's so many christian workers any little thing that happens to them the only thing they know to do is to complain the only thing they know to do is to murmur the only thing they know to do is to panic and be fearful the only thing they know to do is to drop the work of god and say well i'm going through this i'm going through it. look at this challenge and look at this challenge but if you will turn around and there'll be a total conversion of your personality personality a total conversion of your attitude you'll see more miracles than ever in jesus name it says as they as they began to sing it says and to praise the lord god the lord sent ambushments against the children of ammon and moab and mount Seir, all of them all your enemies will be confounded which were come against judah and they were tell me tell me they were smitten then in verse 22 is 23 it says and the children of ammon and moab stood up against the inhabitants of Seir, utterly to slay and to destroy them and when they had made an end of uh, the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another they will not destroy you they would only destroy themselves. But that comes as a result of praising God in the trial and praying to God in the tribulation. And all that they had gone through, they were just praising the Lord. You will start a new life of praising the Lord. And as you do, enemies will be conquered in your life in Jesus' name. I need to say that for myself too. Say that for yourself. In Jesus' name. Point number two now. We're coming to point number two is the word of salvation from the preachers. As uh, the Philippian jailer woke up suddenly and he saw that all the prison doors were opened and everyone's bands loosed. He thought they would have escaped. And because of that, he wanted to kill himself. Because if they woke up in the morning and they saw that all the prisoners had ex escaped, the authorities will call the Philippian jailer and say, give account. What happened? And then he will lose his life. And he didn't want to lose his life in such an agonizing way, such a terrible way. Because of that, he said, let me finish myself. And Paul and Silas cried to him and said, don't kill yourself. We're still here. We're not running away, people. We're still here because we're want to know why God opened the doors of the prison. You see, there are people that are too much in a hurry. They do not say, what am I going to do now that all the doors are open? What am I going to do now that the prison doors, all of them are open and the foundations of the prison were shaking? He said, don't kill yourself. We're still here. That's why we want to come to Acts chapter 16, verse 30. 
Acts chapter 16 in verse 30 in verse 30 and brought them out and said sirs what must I do to be saved look at verse 31 in verse 31 and they said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house and then in verse 32 we're told and they speak unto him the word of the Lord look at this and to all that were in his house they spoke to him the word of the Lord not only himself alone they now spoke to all that were in his house as we look at those verses we're looking at three things number one the seekers willingness to be saved the seekers willingness to be saved number two the supreme will to save sinners God wants sinners to be saved is not willing that any should perish and so you have the supreme will of God to save sinners number three is the sure word of salvation for every soul the sure word of salvation for every soul number one the seekers willingness to be saved Number two is the supreme will of the Lord to save sinners. Number three is the sure word of salvation for every soul. We're looking at uh, number one, the seeker's willingness to be saved. Seeker's willingness to be saved. We're coming to Acts chapter 16, verse 29. It says, then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and then in verse 20 he asked verse 30 he asked the great question in his heart and he brought them out and said sirs Paul and Silas sirs he was not looking down on them now as prisoners he said sirs he knew they had the word the word of the supernatural the word of salvation the word that can save him from sin and from the consequences of sin and so he was looking up to them and he said sirs what must I do you to be saved he had the willingness to be saved as we go to talk to people we pray before we get to them and as we get to them the prayer we are prayed and the things the lord would have done before we get to those people will condition their heart will turn their heart will transform their heart there'll be the willingness to be saved look at acts chapter 2 verse 37 Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 37, now when they heard this, they were preached in their hearts. They were convicted in their hearts. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now they were ready to, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, and then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost verse 39 for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call verse 40 and with many other words did did he testify and exhort saying save yourselves from this unto what generation verse 41 and then they that gladly received his word they had the willingness to be saved they wanted to be saved and when somebody has willingness to be saved repentance will not be difficult when somebody has willingness to be saved faith of the Lord will not be far away and they that gladly received this word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls we're coming to Acts chapter 9 and we're reading from verse 6 Acts chapter 9 reading from verse 6 and he trembling and astonished said Lord what shall thou have me to do that's Paul the apostle when he was saw the Lord met him on the way and a great light shone from heaven he fell to the ground and then he, the Lord said Saul 
Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus answered, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. That's why he now asked, because he was surprised and astonished, he said, Lord, what shall thou have me to do? He had the willingness to be saved. And as we go to sinners and we describe to them, the life of the sinner we describe to them the consequence eternal perdition if somebody remains in sin and we tell them god wants to save you and they have that willingness to be saved their salvation will not be far away you leave them they come to salvation in jesus name let's look at number two there number two there is the supreme will to save sinners God wants sinners to be saved. Please understand, when Adam and Eve fell, and then God showed up in the Garden of Eden, and when he was bringing the judgment, because he had said, the soul that sinneth shall die, the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Yes, judgment came, but God was the one that brought out the plan of salvation without any man praying, without any man seeking, without any man asking. He said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is the beginning of the plan of salvation. It came from God willingly, voluntarily, lovingly, without anybody putting pressure on him. He wants sinners to be saved. And let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're reading from verse 3. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. This is good and this is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Look at this in verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved? There's, there's no problem on the side of God. He has not consigned or confined anybody to condemnation or damnation. He literally, he wants everyone saved. And as you meet people, before you meet them, understand in your heart, meditate in your heart. This one is a prospect for salvation. God wants him to be saved. Once he hears the word of God, and I explain as best as I can, there's no side, in, there's no problem in the sight of God because there's no challenge. As it may be, God doesn't want this one to be saved. He doesn't want this one to come into the knowledge of salvation. He wants everyone. That's the supreme will of the Almighty God to save sinners who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Look at John chapter 3 verse 14. John chapter 3 verse 14. It says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. In verse 15, it says that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and in the wilderness, everyone that looked up to the brazen serpent, not to Moses, not to the preacher, not to the prophet, but would look to the one that is lifted up. It says, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Look at verse 16. It says, for God so loved the world. For God so loved all his creatures. For God so loved all the sinful world. For God so loved all the world that is gone astray that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever understand uh, as we meet people tomorrow they may dress uh, one way or the other they may be covered like that side or that side they may come from whatever background whosoever believeth in him uh, should not perish 
what you are to do then your duty is to point them to the one that you believe in your duty is to so speak convincingly and so speak persuasively and make a connection between the sinner and the savior and make the sinner to desire to want to be saved because on the side of god his supreme will is that they should be saved therefore it is your responsibility as the preacher to link them to god that they will desire that salvation shall not perish but have everlasting life look at verse 17 for god sent not a son into the world to condemn the world what do you do as a preacher how do you preach how do you talk to sinners? There are, some, there are some preachers, they take delight in condemning people. And they will point to them and they will mention all the sins they can remember from the book and from anywhere. And if that person is not trembling and shaking and crying, they say, I've not condemned him enough. And they'll bring out other things to condemn that person. They feel that when they brought beat the sinner and they crush him and he gets on the ground and then he cries, he doesn't see the Savior. All he can see is his sin. All he can see is his wretchedness. All he can see is that he's a miserable, rejected sinner. And then he even begins to doubt, I've gone so far, will God ever save me? Jesus said when he came, it wasn't his ministry, it wasn't his intention to condemn the world. And look at the woman they brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, we caught this woman red-handed in adultery. And then where is the man? They didn't bring the man, but they were interested. You know, the people of those days, they like to put the women down. They like to make them like slaves. They like to make them like rags. You use them in, in, in rubbing the, the floor. And so they brought them on. They said, Moses said, you know, there are people that know the quotation they can quote to condemn people. Moses said, such a person will stone him. And then Jesus will stone her. And then Jesus was writing on the ground. That's the good news. Jesus has good news. And when we go out tomorrow, when we go out anytime, we have good news. I said we have good news but if all we have is you've done that that's unforgivable you do that that's unpardonable you do that you are going to burn in hell you do that you are going to suffer forever and ever that's no good news tell us good news it, that's why it says that Jesus said where are those non accusers as no one condemned you and he said no man Lord and Jesus said no one can condemn you once I came to save you. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And he gave him the power to remain in that salvation. As we go out, we're not going to be condemning people. We'll be linking them to the Savior. And as they come to the Savior, no matter how far they have gone, the Lord will save them. I was waiting for a good, good news. Amen. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Everyone, everyone, for that the world through him might be saved. Look at Second Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 9. For the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but God is long suffering towards what? God is long suffering toward us. You see there are some soul winners and preachers they don't have long suffering towards the sinners. I spoke to him before he did not yield he's going to perish he's going to die I'm not going to talk to him again God is long suffering toward us and the people God is sending out to preach to the sinners that you must have that attribute of God characteristic of God and be long suffering and when they reach out to that backslider he remains adamant and remains in backsliding okay he wants to perish we're not going to try again we have better things to do than you know troubling him be saved and be, and be reconciled unto God 
God is long suffering. Go to them again. Maybe I didn't show enough love. Maybe there was no smile on my face. Maybe I was condemn, uh, condemning him. Maybe I said things that made him not to want to yield. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I do not have the good communication approach to bring them to the Lord. You go to them again because you now you ask God because it says he is long suffering towards what? Not willing that any should perish. Not willing that any, any. That means the greatest of sinners, the most wicked of sinners, and the most uh, religious hypocrites. He does not want any to perish, but that all should come to repentance. I pray God will open our eyes. Every person you see on the street, every person you see in the community is a candidate for salvation. In the sight of God, in the mind of God, he doesn't want any of them to perish. And if you will pray before going out, the Lord will show you the key that opens the door of their heart. And the key that will make them to want to listen to you and to surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then to make them willing to be saved. And once they are willing to be saved, then God is willing to save them. The sinner coming to the Savior, there will be salvation in Jesus' name. In Revelation chapter 22 verse 17, Revelation chapter 22 verse 17, and the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And he let him that hear it say, come. And let him, and let him that is a thirst come. Let him that is a thirst come. Hold on. You see, if the people are not thirsty, if the people are not desirous, they will not come. If you, let me ask you, if your child is not eating well, and your child is not taking the good food you want the child to take, what do you do? You give the child something tasty. That will make the child to want to drink water. That will make the child to want to eat the food. If you are preaching and then you see that people are just looking at you. It's like, uh, what's he saying? What's he wanting me to do? What kind of thing is he calling me to salvation? Make them thirsty. Give them reasons that will spur them, that will stir them, that will wake them up and they'll be thirsty. But if you just preach and you say, well, salvation is available. Jesus Christ has died. Whoever wants to be saved, if you want to be saved, salvation is available. What if they don't want? What if they are not thirsty? What if they are not passionate about it? What if there's no desire? You will give them reasons why. And those reasons will make them to come and say, if that's available, if God can do that, if God will do that for me, I want that. Because it says, let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life. Tell me. Tell me out aloud. Uh -huh. Why do we then tell them, you cannot be saved now. You must go and do this and come back before you can be saved. You cannot be saved now because look at this, look at this, look at this. If you don't clean up this, if you don't uh, return this, if you don't restitute this, if you don't clear this, the way you are now, you cannot be saved. But the word of God says, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely it will happen in uh, you know the, at the retreat uh, that uh, you know we just finished Easter retreat in one of the locations here in Lagos there was a man that had this kind of air that you just know that you know you use whatever adjective whatever now uh, coming from the, 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 the most degraded area of the world but you know that person came to the retreat and as one of our you know preachers uh, preached over there and they gave the altar call that man came and gave himself to the Lord and was really saved the air was still like that the appearance was still like that everything was still like that but by the time the man, no, and nobody told him in that district you know if your salvation is going to be real if it's going to be genuine you must do this you must do this the new salvation is free salvation is free 
I said salvation is free by himself by the time he came back the following day he had gone to shave he became like a real gentleman he was a new creature and looking at him well dressed you know that this is real salvation but he didn't tell him before he gave his life to the lord you must go through this and go through this and do this and do that we will preach the gospel in such a way that the sinner will know the price has been paid on the cross of Calvary and when they come and they just turn away from their sin and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ salvation will come to them in Jesus name look at number three there number three there the sure word of salvation for every soul the sure word of salvation for every soul in Mark chapter 1 verse 14 now after that John was put in prison Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel that's what gospel just means good news good news what we're telling them is the good news of the kingdom of God the kingdom of God does not have bad news it only has good news, the gospel. And what Jesus came to bring the world is good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And how did he present that salvation? Verse 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the good news. And believe the gospel. The good news is that all your sins were laid on the Lord Jesus Christ and because those sins were so serious to bring condemnation and to bring eternal life Christ has borne that now repent turn away from those sins and believe the gospel in Acts chapter 20 verse 21 Acts chapter 20 verse 21 it says testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ one on the one hand you turn away from the sin that is killing you Turn away from the sin that is plunging you into the wrath and the judgment of God. That, that's normal. That's normal. A snake is there and the snake has beaten you and the snake is still around. And we say, leave that place. Leave that place for the safety of your own life and for the protection of your own life. That's why you leave that place. That's repentance. Something is bad. Something is eating you up. Something is crushing your life. Something is falling something is going to bring eternal judgment on you something is going to bring fire unquenchable fire on you therefore we say do yourself some good and think about the right approach the thing that is going to burn you turn away from that that's repentance repent ye and believe the gospel believe the gospel that everything you've done in the past once you turn away you believe on the lord jesus christ everything will be cancelled the penalty of sin cancelled the punishment cancelled the pressure cancelled and they both now and for the rest of your life you have peace of god that's the gospel Oswald, believe that and the Lord himself will bring salvation and the joy of salvation will be in your life in Jesus name repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ we're told in Mark chapter 16 Mark chapter 16 we're reading from verse 15 it tells us go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature in verse 16 he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved Saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You know, uh, there are some things, if you do them, you have the profit, you have the advantage, and you have the gain. If you don't do it, nothing happens. You do it, it's good. You do it, it's profitable. You do it, and something good will happen. If you don't do it, nothing it's just like you sow nothing you reap nothing but not in the case of salvation in the case of salvation he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved what if i don't what if i'm not saved 
What if I don't give my life to the Lord? He that believeth not shall be damned. And that is eternal damnation. That's why it's very important. The sure word of salvation has come and it just takes you putting your trust and confidence and faith in the Lord and say, yes, I believe, Lord, you died for my sin and then you are saved. If you're a wise person, a wise sinner, a wise person of the world, you say, I want to do that and have eternal life. Eternal life will come to them in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three is the work of the Savior in the penitent. We're coming to um, Acts chapter 16, reading from verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And then in verse 33, it says, And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized he and all his straightway. In verse 34, it says, And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the work of grace in true conversion. When somebody is truly converted, the work of grace. Number two, the well doing in godliness by new creatures. Number three, the wealth of goodness in transformed Christians. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the work of grace in true conversion. We're reading from Acts chapter 16. And we're reading from, let, let, let's back up to verse 30. We're reading from verse 30. It says in verse 30, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? He wasn't thinking of his wife. He wasn't thinking of his children. He wasn't thinking of his household. I, what must I do to be saved and then look at the answer now in verse 31 they said and they said believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved but we don't stop at the end of your question what must i do to be saved and thou shalt be saved and thy house. You see, he didn't know the scriptures. He didn't know that the salvation was available to him and to all his house, to his wife and to his children. They had to tell him that when you go out to witness, you are talking to an individual and you are in their house. And uh, maybe the wife is, uh, you know, doing something else, going up and down. And the children, too, they are, you know, here and there. And the man is interested in what you are saying. And he wants to be saved. You are the one to politely and cheerfully and happily either tell him to call all the members of the house because salvation is for them too. The deliverance is for them too. Redemption is for them too. But if you only concentrate on him, since he is the only one that is interested and you don't make it broad and wide and he gets saved and then eventually there is a division in the house one is saved and three others are not saved and as a battle there believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house look at verse 32 in verse 32 and they speak unto him the word of the Lord and to all and to all and to all that why in his house look at this even though the man was a sinner he had good authority in his house the apostles had said you'll be saved and your house 
and they didn't know his house he took them to the house and he had influence and authority over his house his house was under subjection and then he said my wife there's something good here these preachers are going to tell us sit down here remember philippi was a gentile city remember these were gentiles and yet he had enough control on his family children come on here these preachers want to tell us the way to life the way to eternal life and they all submitted and they all sat down and so they spake unto him the word of the lord and to all all that were in his house and then we're told in verse 33 in verse 33 and he took them the same hour of the night look at that the same hour of the night he took them and he washed their stripes what do you think about that a change had come he didn't look at them as uh, prisoners anymore, as condemned people anymore. Those people had beaten them with stripes and they were bleeding at their backs. He saw that and when they gave them to him, keep these people, they are insurance people, they are prisoners and they bring a strange religion that we don't understand. This was real conversion. The work of grace had now been done. And the evidence is that without Paul and Silas saying, look at our wounds, won't you do something? Not at all. Did he say that? On his own, because of the change, because of the, the, because of the transformation, he washed their stripes and he was baptized. He and all is. What does that mean? He and his wife. And the children, if it's only himself and the wife, they will have said that he and his wife, but he and all he is straight away. There was no argument. That's the work of grace that had been done in the heart. When somebody is converted, you will see that evidence. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved. It's the grace of God. It's the mercy of God. It's because of the work of Calvary. The salvation has been paid for. But by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now that we are saved and the work of grace has been done, when now his workmanship he has recreated us in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we shall walk in them. It tells us in Titus chapter 2 verse 11, Titus chapter 2 verse 11, it tells us the grace for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. When that grace works in us, and appears to us and we receive that grace and embrace that grace internalize that grace and it does a good work look at verse 12 this is what we'll do teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should now live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world and you can tell from that philippian jail you can see now the sobriety and the righteousness and the godliness in this present world as he took those men of god and he washed their stripes and then even set meat before them look at number two now number two is the well doing in godliness by new creatures we're coming back to acts chapter 16 and we're looking at verse 33 and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes what does that mean the people that had beaten Paul and Silas were his masters. They were the people in authority. And they were of the same tribe, of the same culture, and they were Gentiles together. Now that he became converted, godliness came in, he became a new creature. He was no more in agreement with the Gentiles. He was no more in agreement with the people of the same culture that 
beat the apostles to the point of bleeding he said now i stand clear i declare my stand now that if i had what i have now i wouldn't have supported i wouldn't have agreed with the beating of paul and silas so he said to prove my difference difference in character difference in attitude and difference in lifestyle he took them that same night and washed their wounds and he was baptized he and all his straight away in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 second corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 it says if therefore if any man be in christ is now out of the world he has come out of the world he has come into christ he has come out of sin he has come into the salvation of the lord he has come out of their culture out of their corruption he has come into christ and when somebody comes out of darkness and comes into the light he comes out of the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of satan and he comes into the kingdom of Christ there's bound to be a difference therefore if any man be in Christ is a new creature old things have passed away you know before with all the other people he hated those preachers they're bringing false religion that's not our religion they want to take us away from our tradition away from our culture he was like them but now all that old hatred is gone all that old animosity is gone is now a new creature old tradition everything passed away and behold all things have become new that's the work of grace and the heart of a real convert that now he's a new creature and you have the godliness in his life the nature of god in his life and he tells us in romans chapter 8 reading from verse 1 romans chapter 8 verse 1 he says therefore there is now no condemnation unto them which are in christ jesus the condemnation you beat those apostles and you injured those apostles and you put their feet in the stocks and you held them up and you condemn the righteous servants of God but now he has repented now he believes in the Lord and a difference has come and there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit and then it says in verse 2 it says for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death a change has taken place look at number three there number three is talking about the wealth of goodness in transformed christians the wealth of goodness in transformed christians we're coming back to acts chapter 16 and we're reading from verse 34 acts chapter 16 reading from verse 34 and when he had brought them to his house now if he was not converted he wouldn't have done that he's not supposed to do that he's, he sh he's not a friend to the prisoners he's watching over the prisoners so that their punishment their oppression their persecution will be tight and full but now because he's converted he didn't see himself as the prison warder he didn't see himself as the prison jailer he didn't see himself as uh, the authority he didn't see himself as uh, you know the commander wear your prison clothes and go and do this and go and do that he now saw himself as a fellow brother he saw himself as a member of the family of god and these are members of the family of god i'm a member of the family of god he now saw they didn't complain to him they didn't tell him the prison food is not good enough it's not nutritious enough they didn't say that he himself now knows it can i feed can i live on those uh, you know prison food uh, if i cannot live on that and i'm a child of god they are children of god we are members of the same family and we are brothers in christ now because of that he brought them to his own house 
and he set meat before them and the wife did not say we're gentiles how can we give food to those who are jews because paul was a jew and silas was a jew did he say that life had changed situation had changed and this is how you know the people you are born again and when he had brought them into his house he said to meet before them and he rejoiced he rejoiced the joy of salvation now came out very clearly believing in god with all his house i pray as we go to contact uh, people outside and sinners cultural traditional people society people and we talk to them about Christ will talk in such a persuasive way they'll be willing to be saved and God is willing to save them and we connect the willing sinner with the willing savior and salvation will come to them and the work of grace will be done in their hearts there'll be real transformation in their lives in Jesus name God will use you God will use me God will use all of us and then we'll bring multitudes of sinners out of their sins. We'll bring them to the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Great will be their joy and great will be your reward. Where are you? I say great will be your reward. The Lord put his word of salvation in your mouth and the Lord put the method and the persuasive communication in your mouth. Through you, many sinners will come to the Savior and the work of grace and the work of godliness and the work of goodness will be manifested in their lives in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and pray and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, we've seen what you've done through Paul and through Silas. Do the same and do much more through me.